It now falls to me to uh, introduce the uh, Siva's lecture in computational neuroscience. Uh, this shows you the, the, the quality of the speakers that we've had over the, since the start of, uh, of the highball Siva's lecture. Martin van den Heuvel gave a talk on connectomics. Mu Ming Pu talked on uh, transcriptomics. Paul Thompson in uh, Iceland talked about imaging genomics. And now we have uh, Michel Thibault de Schatten talking about functional connectomes. Uh, Mish is a, a, a longtime friend, a colleague within the, uh, the OHBM hierarchy. He uh, has positions at the University of Bordeaux and the Institut de Cerveau et de la Moyale de Penier in, uh, in the Sorbonne in Paris. He heads the neurofunctional group in Bordeaux. He heads the brain connectivity and behavioral lab in the EECM. He has a background in neuroimaging methodologies, experimental work, theory, clinical translation. He, he, he runs the gamut from very basic neuroscience to methods development to, to uh, clinical translation. He obtained his PhD from uh, Salpetriere, first demonstrated hemispatial neglect could be reversibly produced by white matter disconnection. He did his postdoc at King's College in London, where he mapped the white matter anatomy in the living human brain and produced the, the uh, Atlas of the Human Brain Connections, which we're all very familiar with. He developed the BCB toolkit for computing disconnections, and he produced an atlas of white matter function and the function connectome software to unravel the functional circuits of white uh, functional role of white matter circuits. And he's just recently, last year, uh, 22, sorry, produced a review in science, the emergent properties of the connected brain. So Mr. White Matter is going to give us the benefit of his experience. Michel. Wow, so uh, after an introduction like that, I got to deliver something uh, <laughs> that is not disappointing. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. It's, uh, it's a great treat to be, uh, to be invited to be a speaker in front of wonderful researchers and neuroanatomists here. I'm very touched. Um, we're going to talk about the imaging property of the connected brain. I'll take this opportunity to promote the journal Brain Structure and Function, where I'm editor in chief, which is dedicated to the study of neuroanatomy and its relationship with function. If you submit your paper to Brain Structure and Function, I will handle it at one moment at the end of its process, and you might end up on the cover. Brain Structure and Function is also one of the few journals where you can submit and publish for free today. All right, so when we do science, we uh, are playing with this uh, tripartite relationship between theory, methods, and observations. Um, you could work with observation and theory alone, but there is a limit to how much your eyes can show to shed light on the reality of things. So that's why we're using methods. It's to improve the quality and the perception that we have onto a, a, a natural phenomenon. But methods bias our observation. According to the method you choose, you will see an angle of the reality that might in turn uh, influence our, th our uh, theory about how the brain works. Let's take this example. So those are two neurons in a petri dish, and you will see that uh, the only thing that they want to do is connect together, particularly the one on top that is trying to find its way in a creepy fashion toward the one at the bottom can remind me myself as a young student trying to approach those famous stars in neuroscience. But you can see that the connection happened in different points. What's important to learn about this observation is that those two neurons are the same. They have no difference. The only difference that they have is the way they are connected together and with other neurons. And function, in that case, will emerge from the way they interact with other neurons. So the idea we try to promote is that instead of labeling neuron with function, maybe we should try to understand and label function onto the connections. And that's the idea behind imaging property. Those neurons together connected are more than the sum of the part of their activity and function emerge from their interaction. It's so a bit of the sum up of uh, what we tried to explain that review with Stephanie Focal, where we uh, metaphorically say that circuit create network by stringing together many brain regions to orchestra orchestrate a brain symphony conducted by finely attuned connections with variable 
caliber and myelination. Every neuron is an instrument, but the music emerge from their interaction. And that's a bit what you're trying to do with a big brain consortium. You're trying to do more than the sum of the part of each member. Today we can measure those connections in the living human brain. And all those are like a, a lot of deniers and people bringing down diffusion weight and imaging. It is a fantastic method to study the connection of the living human brain. It's not only a fantastic method, it is the only method to study connection in the living human brain. How it works, um, in the MRI scan, we're gonna measure the orientation of the diffusion of water molecule inside the brain. On the left, you have a magnified voxel inside the cortex where you have uh, neurons and uh, uh, glial cells that do not provide a very structure constrained to the diffusion of water. And so water molecule will diffuse aleatorily in that tissue. This profile of diffusion, you can summarize it with a mathematical model, which here we chose to illustrate the tensor. Um, Oh, it's interesting. Okay, great. Uh, that like, looks like a sphere here because there is no uh, preferential direction of the diffusion of water inside that tissue. On the right of that panel, you have a magnified version of a voxel in the white matter where you can see that the structure is radically different, made of axons that are uh, most of the case myelinated and will constrain the diffusion of water molecule in the direction of those axons. Accordingly, the tensor model uh, will look like an ellipse that is deformed according to the main direction of diffusion of water molecule inside that tissue. And the trick is to piece together this local estimate to build trajectories that in turn in 3D will make bundles so that at the world brain level will make what we call the human brain connectome. Those streamlines that you can see, although they are anatomically correct, do not correspond to single axons. Of course, they are like the sum, the average of thousands of axons. That's why you shouldn't say fiber count, but more streamline counts. However, you can't really bring those very high technology in the clinical side, because you can't take patients and tell them, I'm going to give you an MRI scan for an hour and a an half to be sure I can see the disconnection of the third branch of the superior longitudinal fasciculus in your brain. That is not going to happen. A lot of patients are not MRI proof. There is not enough time on the MRI scan and that's also very costly. So unfortunately, we have to find a way to get this information differently. So that's why we created the BCB toolkit. There was a simple way to project the lesion of the patient in the space of healthy participants just to estimate the probability of disconnection of given tracks. And we created those probability maps, so you can see at the bottom right, where the hottest region are the regions that are most likely disconnected. This is obviously a uh, French technology, and not everybody is happy to uh, use it. You have at the bottom references to American technologies that roughly do the same if you would like to use it instead. Why does it matter? Because you can actually revisit the way you interpret the relationship between uh, symptoms, function, and location in the brain. Do you know those three persons? Do, you know, do you know the person on the left? Of course. What was the prime with Phineas Gage? Any idea? Of course you do. What happened to Phineas Gage? Exactly, exactly. Radically changed his personality, became highly aggressive, and had a lot of difficult of executive function in planning his day. Uh, and he did recover with time. Um, and you have had like several papers showing the location of the damage as being the medial orbitofrontal cortex, which, by the way, always corresponds to where the bar entered, but we never talk about the dorsolateral cortex, which is where the bar came out as potentially damage in Phineas Gage. But this led us to think that the medial orbital frontal cortex is essential for the personality and the control of emotions. We know the person in the middle. Exactly. Hard to recognize from the picture, but we can recognize his brain, that's Le Boigne. Uh, 
who lost the ability to produce speech um, um, after his death uh, has been exhumed. They removed his brain and revealed that he had a lesion in the posterior part of the inferior frontal gyrus, leading us to call this area as a broke area, which was a person who exhumed the corpse, and uh, labeling it as a crucial center for the production of speech. And we know the person on the right. HM. HM is also another famous patient that um, after surgery he had you know, quite severe epilepsy. He had a bilateral surgery of the medial temporal lobe, typically interpreted as damaging the hippocampus on both sides, because that was the entire portion of the hippocampus, and that was not the only damage. Woke up being able to speak, being able to walk, but was not able to build any more new episodic memory, which was interpreted as a short-term memory impairment. So that led us to put a flag of episodic memory onto the hippocampus. Now, with the meta I just showed you before, and if you remember the little gimmick I showed you at the beginning, you can change the method to change the observation and eventually change the theory that is behind the origin of the symptom in those cases. If you look at the disconnection in the case of Phineas Gage, you can see that Phineas Gage had a, a disconnection of the ancinate fasciculus and a lot of frontal frontal connections. And this is interesting because if you take cats, do not do that at home, and you cut the ancinate fasciculus, they radically change their personality and become very bad kitties. They become like really aggressive. Then he had a lot of uh, disconnection of um, intralobar frontal connections that probably damage uh, uh, the branching in the frontal lobe, which is a typical model that has been described for the organization of the frontal lobe. So the low planning for uh, the future. And if you read like the description of Phineas Gage day by day, there is a day when he came out from the medical office in Sin Boot and Pijama Pants in winter in Vermont when it's really cold. He almost died. There's clearly a lack of planning. Obviously, it's the 19th century, neuropsychology was not even existing at that time, so there was no test to have it. But we have the description of the behavior of the patient. Now, if you take Louis Victor Le Borgne, um, its lesion, which on the surface look at the lesion of the posterior part of the inferior frontal gyrus, uh, thanks to the work of Nina Drunkers, we could see with the MRI scan of Le Borgne the lesion extended to all the perisivian white matter. So this is just an illustration of the same result that we show here, where multiple track of the perisivian white matter that connect all the typical core regions that we describe belonging to language were disconnected in Le Bon. In the case of Henri Molaison, the bilateral lesion of the medial temporal lobe disconnected main connection of the limbic system, such as the phonics, the cingulum, and the ancinate fasciculus. The phonics is interesting because sometimes, you know, patients have a cyst located right here, a neurosurgeon removing the cyst sometimes accidentally cuts the phonics and patients come out with deficit of short-term memory. The other interesting part is like the cingulum connects the hippocampus to retrospinal cortex to the anterior cingular cortex. The retrospinal cortex, which is here, is the area that reduces the most if cortical thickness has most of amyloid plaque and most of the hypometabolism in Alzheimer's disease, which is typical for the loss of episodic memory. And then the ancinate fasciculus has been described as being essential to create memory based on emotion. I don't know how your memory works, but mine is pretty much related to emotion. So if a big emotion happened during my day, I will tend to remember better what happened. This is just an illustration of how by changing the methods, you change the observation, and then suddenly symptoms were not coming from the location of the region damage, but the circuits that were interrupted. I just, I don't know if you're convinced or not, but I just want to tell you that this explanation is at least as good as the other one. Um, we can technically just opt for this one as much as we can go for the localization of the lesion. So 
This is a method of uh, looking at disconnection, and I'll give you an example in a group patient studies and what we can do. We've been studying anosognosia for hemiplegia, which is a typical neurological uh, uh, behavioral manifestation where patients are not aware of their motor impairment. So that's the case of Giuseppe, and the neuropsychologist will ask him to uh, lift his arm. And Giuseppe is lifting his arm in his head, but he's not lifting his arm in reality. And if you ask him if he lifted his arm, he's going to say yes. It's a complete delusion about what he can do. And the video goes on and on until the neuropsychologist asks uh, the patient to clap in his hand, and you see the patient clapping only with one hand and being under the belief that he's clapping with his two hands. That happened quite often, uh, quite often. That happens sometimes after a lesion in the brain. And what we did, we took about 100 patients, about half of those with anosognosia for hemiplegia, and half of those without anosognosia for hemiplegia. We did the lesion overlapping and found that the overlap of lesions that were leading to this syndrome were usually mostly in the white matter. So we took our best tools and tried to look at what kind of white matter was damaged, and we could find that multiple circuits were typically damaged in the case of patients with anosognosia for hemiplegia, particularly frontostriatal cingulum, frontal aslan tract, and third branch, ventral branch, of the frontoparietal connections. What's interesting is if you use Bayesian statistics to see which model is the most appropriate to explain the variance in your data, you will find that um, Typically, gray matter area location are significant, but disconnections are way more, have way more explaining power than uh, the location of the lesion. And you can see the same thing if you were taking all the gray regions that were significant and all the white matters that were significant. You have a huge difference in uh, the uh, Bayesian factors that can explain the model. And of course, if you put it all together, this is the best model. So we were wondering whether you can have only, uh, if you can have like four different kinds of anosognosia for hemiplegia, which is not good enough to disentangle the behavior between those different patients, or if you needed to have a disconnection with those four, tra four tracks to have this behavioral manifestation. And uh, so we created, and this is one of the first examples, a uh, four-dimensional space that we flattened, that you can see here and the pro distributed the probability of the patients uh, that had anosognosia for hemiplegia. You can see that in order to have anosognosia for hemiplegia, there you go, you need to have a disconnection of all those tracks at the same time. So the flavor of symptoms that you can see in the patient come from the combined disconnection between those different circuits, and the symptoms is emerging property of the disconnection of those circuits. So that led us to think about how to improve this representation or space of disconnections and uh, statistics on those disconnections. Well, we saw and we developed a software uh, that is called MUSES that create a little bit like what we saw uh, with Michael yesterday, based on UMAP, a two-dimensional space where you can organize your data, here, brain disconnection, with patients close together that have the similar profile of disconnection and far apart where they have a dissimilar profile of connection. And the idea is such space is like a map. You can see here a territory of data where you can start coloring subregions that are related to symptoms such as aphasia, you have the valley of aphasia, the mountain of visual neglect, the river of anosognosia for hemiplegia. As you can see here, colored in green and in red. That was the idea. Before that, we needed a big number, so we collaborated with Parash Kefnachev in London that provided us, provided us 1,333 stroke lesions. So that allowed us to create this two-dimensional space of what are the typical disconnections that happen in stroke? You can see here at the bottom right. And you see that patients that have similar disconnection uh, cluster together, and the ones that have different disconnection are far apart from the ones that clustered. 
And then we imported into that space the data set from Moridio Corbeta uh, with, uh, that is very richly explored in terms of uh, behavior and started running our statistics to define territory places of disconnection of the brain that will be typically associated with deficits at a specific tests such as motor language or visuospatial attention. And so we discovered that uh, uh, not only this approach was able to capture imaging property of like system of discon disconnection together related to symptoms, but it was also statistically convenient to reveal uh, symptoms that can emerge from completely different profile of disconnection. So you have a plurality of solution to a given problem. Here, for example, visual special attention, in the case of you have to disengage from a target that you saw on the left to see a target on the right, or a target on the right to see on the left, may happen after a lesion in the right hemisphere or the left hemisphere and have a unilateral impact. So if you put that together in the same statistical model, you get nothing significant because those two cases will compete with each other for significance. But with this approach, you can have two territories that explain significantly a uh, similar outcome. And so we repeated that for 88 score of neuropsychology and start projecting the top significance onto the white matter and creating those maps of uh, symptoms emerging after the disconnection of given tracks. So we call that the disconnectome symptom discoverer because the prediction that we do are for patients one year after their lesion. And we did that because we saw it was convenient to know as soon as a patient come to uh, the hospital whether it will recover or not for language or motor impairment. And to make it convenient, we also created a website where people can just upload the disconnect home, press run, and have directly the predicted outcome one year after the lesion. So here is an example for the motor score. Just upload your disconnect home that you calculate with the BCB toolkit. You press run. It's going to take you a minute. It will give you exactly the coordinate inside the UMAP space that I showed to you and the prediction for the symptoms, oh, those are different motor um, outcome. There you go, this is actually quite fast. Um, and we do that also for language, visual, special, memory, and so on and so forth. It's all free, uh, although it does cost us 20 euros a month to maintain it. Um, so how good is it to predict? Well, we been careful enough to keep 20% of your data aside in order to see whether the uh, prediction was good enough. So here you have the predicted values, here you have the observed value, if you have the subtraction between the two, uh, it's roughly, uh, it's pretty good for clinical scores that you predict one year after the lesion. Uh, we compared, thanks to reviewers uh, that always ask you to do the impossible, or this model with any other possible models that you can do to predict. That was a very hard job and uh, it worked pretty well. And then, thanks to reviewers that always ask you the impossible, we've been able to collect data from, uh, well, through a collaboration from United States, Ohio, um, from different parts in France to predict completely out of sample data sets the performance of patients. And you can see here uh, that verbal fluency was predicted and visual special abilities were predicted significantly. It's not perfect, but so far um, we have nothing better to predict out of sample stroke outcome. Here you have like uh, exemplified like three patients where you can do individual prediction. And you can see here, for example, this patient uh, that have a deficit mode of function. You have the comparison between the observed behavior in blue and the predicted behavior in red. You can see that uh, as a disconnectome symptom discover predicted a deficit, although it's a little bit more optimistic than the neuropsychologists that might have given up on asking the patient to move after a while. So I showed you that looking at brain lesion and symptom, if you look at brain disconnection, you can actually have, some, have substantial explanation about the mechanisms that happen that can lead to symptoms and have quite significant prediction of the outcome. So it looks like 
changing a little bit the method and looking at circuit and this connection has a better explanatory powers than looking at the location of the lesion itself. How about functional imaging now? So that's another way to study function in the brain. So we saw we did the disconnect home. Maybe we can use a similar framework and extend it to functional neuroimaging. So very originally we called it the functional ectom. Um, and the idea was to take the information from the cortex and project it onto the white matter using a simple weighted average of the probability of connections. So when you think the wall is more than the sum of the part, this is the weighted average of the wall might show more significance than the activation in the cortex. This is what we did, and we exemplified this with uh, um, uh, the function ectom analysis of the finger tapping of the human connectome project. And we could see, if you look at the uh, bottom image, that you have typical activation in the uh, motor gyrus, particularly in the omega sign that correspond to the hand. Uh, but if you apply the function ectome, you have an entire circuitry of cortical, subcortical, and uh, uh, corticospinal tract, as well as the cerebellum that light up and show you the entire circuit related to a mode of finger tapping instead of just simple activation in the cortex. So this is an example of the application of this method to uh, visual consciousness. So we use a paradigm where you manipulate attention three different way and you have to detect targets that are barely visible. So sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't see it. And that allow you to uh, measure visual consciousness by contrasting when you saw it versus when you didn't see it independently of attention uh, because you manipulate it in different way. If you do this contrast with classical analysis, you obtain a very good activation of the anterior part of the occipital lobe and the intraparietal sulcus, probably the main area of visual consciousness according to functional MRI. Um, but if you use a function in terms, then you have an entire circuitry of connections uh, that are temporal parietal, frontal parietal, thalamic, and with the corpus callosum uh, connecting language areas. If you contrast the um, level of significance in your images, uh, you find an interesting double dissociation. I'll be on the top right of the slide, where if you look at activations, uh, typically the function ectom that is in red will show higher activation than uh, the classical analysis, where we could claim that this is the, more, the wall is more than the sum of the parts. But in terms of deactivation that you have on the left, you'll see that the function ectom actually show less significance when they are deactivation. It means that it doesn't look like the meta is just increasing activation. We really capture something unique that is happening when areas are connected and you sum the activity in the white matter. And then you can uh, putatively interpret how does it work. Well, visual information will be processed eventually along the visual ventral stream that is not conscious but have to be conveyed to the frontal parietal in order to be manipulated in the brain and become conscious. And if you cut this relationship between the visual ventral stream and the frontal parietal, then you lose the awareness. And that's why we see in visual neglect, so typically it shows a martial and elegant uh, type of visual neglect. Um, that is a lack of awareness of the control regional field. Um, you can, you also have like the frontal parietal that is essential to maintain visual information. Same thing, if you cut it, you'll have visual spatial neglect and uh, a patient will lack the awareness of one of the visual field. Um, you have uh, interhemispheric connections and that we have that will be essential for the verbalization of what you see, which is critical in uh, the awareness, the consciousness of what you saw. And again, if you cut this part, you can have visual neglect. And finally, the thalamus is essential and most, re most recent review by Max Schein is claiming that the thalamus is a conductor of the synchrony in the brain, but the one that can finely tune how, how the synchrony between brain regions happen. And if you damage the lateral dorsal portion of the thalamus, you also have visual neglect. So you can see how symptoms emerging from the disconnection will match in that case functional imaging projecting on the connection. You can find a match between 
symptoms and function, symptoms studied in patients and functions studied in healthy controls in light of studying brain connections. So you can repeat that hundreds of times and start creating those maps, where this time you project the term that is studied in functional neuroimaging onto the white matter. That will be the map on the right. Uh, you can see that you have like a, okay, a pseudo words and language on the left and center you'll have memory. On the right you'll have impulsivity and maintaining information and so on and so forth. Another part of interim conclusion, so I showed you that if you modify the method and this time project functional neuroimaging onto the white matter, you seem to have a higher significance uh, in the few cases that I showed. And it seems that it's a good way to make a link with pathology and together being a, a, a good model of uh, the functioning of the brain and the dysfunctioning of the brain. Now, I work in an institute where everybody is doing histology and cellular imaging, so they can like, okay, but that's neuroimaging, we don't believe in it. So I had to extend a little bit into uh, histology, which I recently did. It takes an awful long time, but that's very interesting. So we've been working on uh, squirrel monkeys that are very interesting because uh, they do not smell bad. That's the first thing, that's what the first criticism people say. Uh, but also they're very cute and you can put them all in the same cage and they interact together. You can spend hours looking at the life of squirrel monkeys. Um, scientifically they're also very interesting because on the evolutionary tree they're a little bit more distant to humans than the rhesus monkey because they're part of the new world monkeys and so you can, if you study that species and look at the data and put it in light of the other species, you can dig deeper and further in the uh, evolution tree and find new evolutionary rules. And the brain has been pretty much well studied and partially mapped on, in terms of uh, functional fields. So uh, we have data to, to work on and they are comparable to resist monkey in terms of their functional organization and therefore can be a good model to uh, uh, study this connection and compare it to human. And the part that is important to know, all right, um, is that like the brain is circumvoluted, not much, but enough to have association fibers, which is not really the case in the marmoset. And that's why we didn't go for a marmoset model. We scan in very high resolution in 11.5 uh, teslas or uh, 15 squirrel monkeys and make the data available for all to study brain evolution and anatomy of that species. So you can go on uh, Nature Scientific Data or our website, summary.bcblab.com and download the raw data or the process data according to whatever you want to do to investigate uh, the new anatomy of uh, these species. Um, but in the present case, we were interested in uh, the um, di disconnection paradigm, and so we thought like it'll be good if we can map in advance precise connection and then use an injection, very fine injection of this myelinated product onto a given track and measure visuospatial performance to demonstrate that it is an emerging property. And those are obviously preliminary data. If change. Um, so we build this paradigm where you have this puzzle with reward in these different little uh, windows and the squirrel monkey comes in and is very well trained and um, pick up the reward that is uh, behind the little, the little window clap that it has to open. That's very good because with these paradigms then you can play with like a, a stickers you put on the different clap head and like, you can see and measure reinforcement. But for now we were interested into whether or not they will explore the entire puzzle, because that a puzzle. And um, this is a, the training session, but in the experimental session there is a tunnel to get in, so we show them it's coming from the left and the right, and that will typically uh, uh, change their behavior. So as you can see, they're extremely cute, really a nice species to work with. 
Um, and so we, um, we did an injection of LPC and uh, frontopietal connections. You can see here, unfortunately, the MRI scan like uh, shunted uh, just after the injection. So we had to do a street Tesla MRI scan to show that. You can see on, on the MRI scan the entrance of the uh, four diaphragm injections that we did that are like on the superficial layer of the white matter where you have typically those associated frontopietal connections. It's pretty far from the motor cortex. You can see that before we did the injection on the frontopietal connection, the monkey is equally taking the reward on the left and on the right of the puzzle. And as soon as we did, well, one day after the injection, time for the product to dismyelinate the frontopietal connection, the monkey stopped taking uh, the reward on the left part of the puzzle and take it still, take all the reward on the right part the same at G plus four and the same at G plus five. And this is independently for touching any of the cortex, just the association between the frontal and the parietal that had been disrupted through the dismyelination of the connection. Final conclusion. So I showed you that in patients, if you look at these connections, you can reinterpret symptoms as the emergence of the interruptions of communication between brain regions. I should use that in functional neuroimaging. If you project fMRI onto the white matter looking at priors of how things are connected, using priors of how things are connected, you increase the significance and you can have a result that is easier to interpret in terms of mechanism happening in the brain and linking up with symptoms. And finally, I should use that in animals, if you temporarily disrupt the communication between brain regions, you can have the similar behavior that you can see in patients when you have a brain disconnection, but in a perfectly controlled environment. So changing the method, we change the observation, and we propose these new theories that function, emerge from the interaction of brain regions. Thank you very much.